it's great to see so many participants and attendants online. Before I make my opening remarks, I'd like to note that as a consequence of unexpected developments in the operational environment, and contrary to earlier communication, UniWider will be the sole host of this conference. For those of you who are less familiar with the Institute, United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research, UniWider, was established about 35 years, uh, years ago to provide economic analysis and policy advice with the aim of promoting sustainable and equitable development for all. I think it's not an overstatement to say last year was for our institute, as for most people, one of the hardest ever. So the COVID-19 pandemic wreaking havoc and leading to unprecedented challenges on all fronts of development. One of our most cited studies shows that that might be up to 400 million new people living under the poverty line due to the pandemic. Africa is one of the regions that are hardest hit. A number of countries in the continent were already facing serious economic challenges, even before the pandemic, such as low economic growth, budgetary constraints, and rising debt burden. Like the rest of the world, many African countries have undertaken various policies in a bid to suppress transmission of COVID-19. These measures may have met public health objectives to a certain extent, but they have adversely affected economic activities and livelihoods of the poor and vulnerable groups in the society. The attainment of 2030 sustainable development goals will now be very challenging, particularly in the face of diminished resource flows. Due to this new developments occasioned by the pandemic, UniWider has reoriented the focus and organization of our events since last year. This year, UniWider will concentrate on creating dialogue and sharing knowledge on the multiple effects of COVID-19 in the developing economies, states, and societies. This conference has served as one of the much needed forum for this discussion focusing on Africa. One year has now passed since the non novel coronavirus disease was identified. It's time to take stock and chart the way forward for Africa. Another major opportunity for dialogue on these matters will be our annual conference, the Wider Development Conference, which will take place on September 6 to 8 this year. The annual conference will discuss the implications of COVID-19, more broadly focusing on all developing regions. The key messages and questions raised in this conference will help to inform the general debate on the topic, as well as the discussions at the September conference. In this conference, we'll discuss the socioeconomic implications of COVID-19, development challenges, emerging opportunities, and policy solutions in the context of the African continent. The conference will feature speakers from international development partners, scholars, and policy experts, as well as our very own UNUI researchers. It's a two half day conference. So the first day of the conference, which is today, we shall discuss the development challenges and the impact of COVID-19 on African economies, starting with a keynote address by Dr. Vera Songwe, the UN Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNICA, followed by a panel discussion and with Q&A at the end of each session. Tomorrow, we'll have two main sessions, each consisting of three presentations. The first session will focus on the implications of the pandemic on livelihoods and wealth. The second session will be a panel discussion on the new normal and the future development of Africa. This session will offer some insights on the kind of future to envision for Africa post the pandemic. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Vera Songwe, our keynote speaker. Vera Songwe is the UN Under Secretary General, the ninth Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa becoming the first woman to lead the institution in a 60-year history. As the Executive Secretary, Dr. Songwe's reforms focusing on ideas for a prosperous Africa have brought to the fore critical issues of macroeconomic stability, development finance, private sector growth, poverty and inequality, digital transformation, and trade and competence. Recently listed as one of Africa's most powerful women by Forbes, named as one of 100 Most Influential Africans by Sean Freak in 2019, 100 Most Influential Africans by New African Magazine in 2017, and one of the 25 Africans watched by Financial Times in 2015, Vera Song is acknowledged for a long-standing track record for providing policy advice and a wealth of experience in delivering development results for Africa. With this introduction, you can all agree with me that we would have made a better choice for a keynote speaker for this conference, also keeping in mind the pertinent role UNIC is playing in the development process I would like to invite Dr. Songwe to present the keynote lecture. 
but it's only over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. I have a set of slides that will come up in a few minutes, but before I start, um, let me thank, um, of course, the head of UniWider, uh, Fatima Denton, my former colleague, for um, having us here today at the, as the Economic Commission for Africa for having me. Um, I think, uh, again, UniWider's platform is a very important platform for having this debate to see where Africa can learn from the past, take stock of what's happening, and then, you know, see how we go forward together. This is a global pandemic. We will need to all work together for it to be able um, to, for us to be able to win the, the challenge. Um, listen, I, my talk was supposed to be on Africa's challenges for the crisis, what we need to do, how we need to get out of it. I would like to go through, just as a summary of the slides, you know, what's happening on the health side. We've seen in the last, I would say, two weeks, an acceleration in the case fatality rates on the continent. What we see now is essentially it used to take us about a week, uh, we, will, we would lose 100, and it took us a week, 146 days to lose 20,000 people. So 146 days to lose 20,000 people sometime in March of 2020. Fast forward to today, and actually it is sobering because last week or two weeks ago, it was taking us 26 days to lose the same 20,000 people. And of the data of last Wednesday, which is yesterday, it's taking us 15 days. So we're losing nine times more people. We're losing people faster, nine times faster than we did at the beginning of the crisis. Clearly Africa is in the second wave. We need to find ways of getting out of it. And again, as most of you must have seen, there is now the South Africa strain, the UK strain. So yes, we do have a semblance of a vaccine, but will that work? So we are almost where we were in March of last year, but with, a little, with, but with a lot more uncertainty on the health side. Africa is facing three crises at the same time. It is facing a health crisis. It's facing an economic uh, crisis, health, a health pandemic, I should say. It's facing an economic crisis and it's facing a climate challenge. We have to address all of these things together. One of the unique problems with this particular crisis is also that it's a global crisis. It is not a crisis of one African country's making. It is not the crisis of the continent's making. It's an external crisis, which requires the global commons to come together to respond to, to it. Now, you must have read many of you in many newspapers, the fact that next slide, the fact that Africa did well last year, Africa came out of the crisis better. And that is true. But in 2021, we are not as prepared. We got into 2020 with a lot more buffers. We had fiscal revenue that was coming in. We had good reserves. We had good macroeconomic stability. So we could actually respond to the crisis. Our growth was better. The crisis has dealt a severe blow to all our growth. As you can see here, the blue line 2019, the red line 2020. So getting into 2021, growth is already being depressed. Already we were not growing that fast. And so essentially what you see is again a huge dip in growth for the continent, which means that we are not prepared or we are not as, if we assume that we have prepared in 2020 to deal with the crisis. And yes, our countries put together almost $49 billion to respond, drawing from their reserves, drawing from their revenue to 2020. 2021 has hit us and COVID is still here. The climate, the climate challenge is still here, but we have run out of revenue resources. Uh, to respond to the crisis. What does this mean? This means that our debt is going up. Our debt to GDP, of course, if growth dips, the, denomin the denominator reduces. And so the share of debt to GDP goes up by definition. But also countries have had to dig deep to be able to respond to the crisis. So what we see is a rising trend in uh, debt to GDP levels on the continent. Overall, satisfactory debt to GDP levels are debt to GDP levels that are below 60%. Uh, and as you can see, we start hitting the 60% mark. If you can see this a little bit small, but if you can see the graph on your left, we start hitting the 60% mark just as we hit 
uh, 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 Rwanda. And so all those countries after Rwanda uh, have a debt to GDP, which is higher than 60%. So this means that these countries are getting into a, a moderate to high risk of debt distress. And you know, then we have to face the, the problem. Uh, the graph on your right is essentially the middle income graph that gives you a sense of where the middle income countries are. And as you will see, even the middle income countries are, so are beginning to see a surge in their debt to GDP levels. Prices, inflation, inflation has gone up. As you can see, the red, the red is 2020 uh, and the blue was 2019. Inflation is always a precursor of hardship for particularly uh, our vulnerable, our informal sector economy, because it means prices of everything are going up. It means life becomes difficult. It means the ability to be able to feed oneself and one's family becomes even more difficult. But also inflation has proved to be a huge cause of social pressures across the continent. We know that if we look around those Burkina Faso, Mali, Sudan, every time we have had one of those crises, it is because inflation has been running rampant. And so we do need to watch uh, this rising inflation in particular countries to make sure that it doesn't cause, in addition to COVID and the economic downturn, social crisis. Uh, increased private uh, sector external debt, of course, I talked about the debt problem already. We talked about the debt stock. Our debt stock is increasing, but we're going to need more resources to be able to respond uh, to the crisis. We, of course, COVID. Uh, all the sort of external supply chains, global supply chains were disrupted. The Swiss Canal, where Egypt, for example, gets almost 30% of its revenue was shut for almost three months. There were no, uh, uh, no, no traffic going through it in terms of trade. Um, essentially, Africa could not trade with the world. The world could not trade with Africa because people closed their borders. And so again, an important source of external revenue of foreign exchange earnings for Africa was lost. Uh, because of the crisis. We now need to figure out how we're going to bring that back. I talked about Africa facing uh, uh, the crisis and on the economic front. Remittances, many of the African countries depend on remittances um, for foreign exchange earnings, over 10% in some countries, Gambia, Comoros, Seychelles, uh, Morocco, are countries that you know, use, depend on, on uh, remittances. Remittances are an important component of economies as we know, because they send direct resources to individuals and actually help uh, ensure that particularly the poorest are lifted out of poverty. We know particularly for women that they depend on remittances. We know that a lot of kids schooling, a lot of healthcare uh, costs are taken care of through remittances. So when you have 3% of remittances are the share of Africa's GDP, when you lose that, then we start to talk about our contraction in GDP, but more importantly, a drop, uh, in, an increase in poverty because of the lack of one of the tools that made Africa resilient. Foreign direct investment. So remittances, essentially, if you want to look at it, it's essentially flows to the private sector, flows to individuals that essentially help individuals ensure that they can buffer crises and grow in times of prosperity. We lost that. But then foreign direct investment, which is what creates jobs. So on the one end, you are not getting the remittances from you know, the workers abroad, but at the same time, you're not getting the jobs or the businesses that are coming into the, onto the continent to create the jobs. So you see for, for individuals, it is a double hit uh, on both sides. As we see on this uh, graph, foreign direct investment drops substantially in quite a number of countries which also again means loss of jobs, loss, loss of foreign exchange earnings. So the crisis has put Africa in a very difficult situation. A lot of, of course, FDI is external financing, external flows. We could also show you uh, uh, data and statistics. Over 45% of the small and medium enterprises on the continent stopped their activity, lost their clients. So even the internal private sector was itself was suffering, had to let uh, staff go. The informal sector, of course, 70% of Africa's economy depends on the informal sector. When markets are short, when economies are short, when borders are short, we know that the informal sector also falls uh, into trouble. Africa was doing much better. I've given you all the reasons why globally at the macro level, we're not doing well. Our revenues have dropped. We had to spend more to respond 
to uh, the COVID crisis. So it's, it's an, uh, expenditure went up, expenditure went up, fiscal deficits increased, widened, we had to borrow more, debt is going up. So on the sort of large macroeconomic uh, side, we're under stress. On the micro um, side, remittances are dropping, FDI is dropping, so no jobs, no resilience, no buffers for private sector individuals and households. Uh, and, and of course, one would expect that the good progress that we were making in terms of getting out of poverty is going to uh, be reversed because of the crisis. What has also happened, it has exacerbated inequality. When you think about it on the continent, those who have access to the internet and only 17.8% of the continent has access to stable, affordable uh, and accessible internet. So that's those 17.8 households can actually afford to continue keeping their kids in school. But we know that we have over 200 kids that are out of school, which means they've lost a school year. They begin to fall behind. Human capacity skills development is being lost. I showed you the price, the, the price of food and the inflation. Inflation means that only the wealthy can continue to afford basic commodities and basic essential necessities. Travel becomes difficult for everybody. The small and medium enterprise woman who was trading across borders can no longer do that. And so inequality becomes even more exacerbated. That is the problem. You're combining now poverty with inequality as a combination. Achievement of the SDGs, of course, is going to be a lot more difficult as we go forward. Um, what we are trying to do and what we say to ourselves is we hope that if we continue um, to charge on, keep the SDGs, keep Agenda 2063 as initially stipulated, we may actually get there. What are we doing? What is the response? It is a tough crisis. It's a global crisis. If one country has COVID, all the countries have COVID. A big ray of relief was the vaccines. The vaccines have come on board. We are seeing many more countries have access to the vaccines. The United States this morning actually just announced that they're going to vaccinate even more faster than they had initially indicated. So maybe by the summer, all of the United States will be vaccinated and the economy would at least be able to uh, uh, begin to get back to some kind of operability. When we look at the map of the world for vaccinations, we see that a lot of the different parts of the world are already vaccinating themselves, but Africa remains a little bit uh, less able to vaccinate all of the continent. Some countries are already vaccinating. We have, uh, particularly in the North Morocco, it's vaccinating. Uh, uh, South Africa, of course, has started receiving the vaccine. Seychelles is receiving the vaccine. Guinea has started to some extent receiving the vaccine, but in very, very small quantities. We are expecting, like every other country in the world, to see whether we can reach herd immunity by vaccinating 60% of our population. There is a response from the COVAX facility that is going to help Africa. The COVAX facility, of course, is a global facility that has been put together by international donors to support Africa vaccinate 20% of its population. The African Vaccines Initiative is also working to, to vaccinate another 20. And so we still will have a gap, even with these two initiatives going hand in hand, we will have a 20% gap to be able to meet the 60% herd immunity that most countries are targeting. So there is still a lot of work to be done. We do need additional resources to procure the vaccine, the different vaccines out there, AstraZeneca $3, Pfizer more in the order of seven to $9. So they're quite expensive, quite different pricing, but also their effectiveness is very varies. And now we have additional strands coming on the continent, which means we have to think about how we will respond to these new varieties and whether the existing viruses can respond to that. The world has also responded. So there's a COVAX facility that will help Africa respond to the crisis, the AVAT, which is an African facility. The G20 has also responded to the call of African finance ministers to see whether we could suspend debt payments. We saw that our debt was going up. And of course, when the debt is going up, your interest on your debt and all that is going up. And so the G20 was able to say in 2020, don't pay for your debt service, not your debt, it's your debt service, so it's the interest rate that you pay on the debt um, for uh, the low-income countries. What that did was it resulted in about $5 billion savings for the continent, savings $5 billion that could be replowed into getting PPE kits, now looking at maybe procuring the vaccine. 
but ensuring that countries had enough liquidity to respond to the crisis, pay salaries, and ensure that basic commodities were, uh, that were needed were in place. There has been an injection of financing for the continent altogether, which as uh, the multilateral development banks, African Development Bank, the World Bank have come together as well. And some uh, resources have been put to ensure that at least businesses can continue, but not nearly enough. Africa in total, if we step back, has received an, a 2% of GDP as a response to this crisis from the global community. Africa itself has provided or extended to itself 2%. So a total of about 4% altogether to respond to the crisis in additional liquidity. The middle income countries of the world have provided about 6% of, have provided and received about 6% of resources. The high income countries have injected 20% of their GDP into their economies by way of new liquidity, new resources to help them respond to the crisis. So I was talking about inequalities in economies and in people before, but if you just look at those numbers, Africa has received 2%, itself injected 2%, so you can say overall 4%. The, the middle income countries, somewhere between six and 8%, the developed countries, 20% of additional liquidity to respond to the crisis. These are some of the uh, uh, issues that we all have to deal with is where do we get this additional re revenue? Where does Africa find the additional resources to respond to the crisis? Of course, the crisis is going to set a blow to Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030, but there are rays of hope. As we know, um, you know, on the ICT sector, we, the other day we had a big conference here with President Uhuru Kenyatta and a couple of young CEOs on the continent. Amazing things are happening on the continent uh, in, in the the internet and ICT sector, which we believe will create and fast track Africa's recovery, but we need to recover. We need to get out of uh, uh, the crisis first before we recover. Africa's banking sector is in stress, but the Africa's banking sector has proved resilient and is one of the ones that is sending and providing additional resources for renewed investment on the continent. We need, as we go forward, to find an additional $100 billion to respond to this crisis. There is a lot of conversation and you will hear out there about Africa's debt and Africa's debt crisis. In the beginning of 2021, three countries have taken what we call the G20 uh, debt uh, framework resolution. Those are Ethiopia, um, Zambia, and Ethiopia, Zambia, and Chad. Uh, the rest of the countries are still showing some resilience. And it's for this reason that we need additional liquidity to be able to make sure that those countries that are resilient can continue to grow and can ensure that they get out of this crisis without becoming, uh, uh, without falling into much more massive crises. The faster we can get help, the sooner we can get out of the crisis, the sooner we can move from response to recovery to growth. But that recovery has necessarily to be green. It has to be a recovery that looks at what are the enablers for the recovery, energy, we have to reinvest, double down on investments in energy so that the private sector can come back. We have to double down on investments in clean agriculture, greener, better, more productive agriculture. We have to ensure that our parks, our wildlife is better managed because tourism was beginning, the service sector and tourism and financial sector were beginning to be in particular important parts of Africa's economy. And we need to go back to that. And so when we look at the response, we have to look at it as first, what is our immediate needs, which is an immediate need, what we call the immediate response is liquidity, additional resources, that, that's what it means, put new resources into the hands of governments, into the hands of business, into the hands of the private sector, into the hands of individuals by way of social safety nets. That immediate response of liquidity will help us save the crisis, get our PPEs as individuals, get vaccines as countries. But immediately after that, we, not, we need to start thinking of what is the recovery going to look like? And that's where we start thinking about how we can use instruments like debt swaps, instruments like what we call a liquidity facility, instruments like uh, 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 green bonds to see whether we can raise more resources, more revenue, one to create jobs, 
but secondly, to begin to grow. And over the long term, I think one of the things that this crisis has shown is that Africa, but the global international community, is not prepared for this kinds of global pandemics. We don't know where to go find the resources. So if you are in a wealthy country, of course, you can give yourself additional liquidity through instruments like what we call the special drawing rights. You have a strong currency, so the markets can allow you to continue to have access. But you, if, if you're on the continent, we do not have the instruments. We have to look to the international financial institutions who then need to look into their own uh, 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 accounts to see whether they have enough resources, where can they find new resources. And it takes a year before Africa gets a substantive and robust response. So as we go forward, out of this crisis, we do need to begin to think of what is this new international architecture that is going to be needed. We know that we're gonna have another COVID. We know it may not be a health crisis, it may be a technology crisis, it may be a climate crisis. What we know for sure is another global crisis will come and we do need to start preparing for what a global response to a crisis like that would look like. So I think these are the three steps of how we look at and consider our exit uh, from this COVID crisis is immediate response, liquidity for the countries that have run out of liquidity and are already in a debt crisis, they'll go into a debt sustainability framework. We will have a reprofiling, a restructuring of their debt. But for most, we hope that we can grow out of it with additional liquidity, new and doubling our investments in women, in ICT, in the enablers infrastructure globally. Of course, Africa on January 1, and this is my final point, passed the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which is the blueprint for investment on the continent. And we hope that with the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, Africa will do better and we will be able to lift ourselves out of this crisis. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Sawi, thank you so much for, for your presentation. And so you raised several points here, which I, I wanted to ask you a few questions before we also have questions from the audience. Um, and you, you, um, first point that you raised is so important is the vaccine rollout and how important that is, and the role of COVAX in particular. Second point, or linked to the question about recoveries around debt relief. Uh, and then the third point that you also made, uh, among other points, you also talked about remedies and foreign investments and so on, but also the question of three phase reco uh, recovery, immediate, then the next one, uh, uh, and then the system reset. Now I had a set of questions, one on vaccines and, and one on the public health issue. It seems that if you look at the mortality rates in Africa, the mortality rate to COVID is far lower if you use case fatality, case fatality rates, for example, or normalized population than in many other parts of the developing world. Now again, there are arguments that are being that either it's because of very, very effective public health responses, probably conditioned from experience from, from handling Ebola and other such, uh, similar sorts of diseases, or it could also be the demographic profile of Africa, a very young prof uh, age profile. Would you have a sense of what you think is probably more important explaining uh, the band, uh, re the relatively lower case fatality rates that we see in Africa? That's my first question. Do you want to answer that? Go yes, ahead. please. I, I just want to caution about this sense of optimism. I, I think I started by saying that we were losing it was taking us 146 days to lose 20,000 people on the continent in March of 2020. However, in February of 2021, it is taking us 17 days to lose 20,000 people on the continent. So I think you know that optimism that we had in March of 2020 and the narrative that you have, which is that Africa's kids fatality rate at that time was low is no longer the case. So now that we have the statistic that tells us that our people are dying seven times faster than they did from March through June and even maybe through August of last year, the question is what is different? And I think what is different is that Africa was prepared. Africa was better prepared from March through August. We, if you recall, we didn't have an access to mask and a PPE crisis. Uh, I, in most African countries did not debate the issue of wearing masks. We wore masks. Countries shut down. Uh, we had at the time over 80% of our economies were totally shut down. Offices were shut down, markets were shut down. There was a lot of social distancing happening, hand washing. So I think the Africans followed the science and we did the right things and we did it to the best we could. Now, what happened? 
Christmas came, big holidays, and we forgot the science. And so it wasn't about our, our age population, it was about us leaving the science. And by leaving the science, we started getting the same case fatality rates like uh, in most other countries. Also remember that we are not testing as much. So the data that we have, if you look at it, we're supposed to test 100 per every 100,000 people in the population. Today, only seven African countries are actually reaching that testing number so that we can talk sustainably about where Africa is. And so I think when you look at some of the anecdotal evidence that tells us that hospital beds are full, that you know Kenya is about to run a new survey on sort of fatality rates that are not reported to get the better sense of what is really happening, Uganda is going to do the same. So I think the, the, the most uh, important message is we need to continue to follow the science. It's not about our youth, it's not about our demographics. Yes, what we have learned is we've learned a lot of important lessons from the Ebola crisis about how we can deal and how we can respond to, to pandemics. But I think more importantly, we must respond with the science. We must wear the mask, we must wash our hands, and we must social distance. And we saw that when we didn't do that, we started losing people just as, uh, as much as, uh, actually, I, I think in the, in, the, in the end of December, our case fatality rates were becoming the second highest in the world. So we, we hit that mark like everybody else. That's a very important point here because there was this view of African exceptionalism in the sense that because of the age profile, you know, you didn't have to worry so much about the science. But the point you make, it's very, very relevant, especially as you move to the second and the third wave, that science is really important. And all the things we know from the public health measures that we've seen uh, being effective in other parts of the world uh, is also as important in Africa. And that's a, that's a very important message to get across. And I absolutely think that's, that's really uh, a very important factor. There may be other issues around the age profile, so it might have helped, but they were not the, the most important reason. I, not question on the question of debt relief. As you know, there's been a quite a discussion about increasing special drawing rights uh, for our countries. Um, as you know, you went the UMTAD, for example, has a very large increase in SDRs and so on. And it seemed that there was quite a resistance of this from particular parts of the world, where the view was that, why should we do it? Now we have a change in the political leadership in, in, in a particular, in, in the US, for example, and so on. Do you see much more possibilities in an increase in SDR? But that would be a very important way to provide liquidity, as you mentioned, to developing countries. Yes, um, so SDR is a special drawing rights for those who are wondering. Special drawing rights are essentially uh, central banks printing money. So it's, it's, sort of nobody, it's, it's new money that is printed. The first time we saw special drawing rights used in the middle of a crisis was in 2008 when we had the financial crisis. When we had the financial crisis, the OECD countries got together and you know, printed money, liquidity, to be able to help them get themselves out of that crisis. And it is from that experience that we are saying, well, now we have a global crisis. It's even more important. We are standing to lose, the world stands to lose somewhere in the order of $10 trillion from this crisis. So why don't we use the special drawing rights again? And so the Economic Commission for Africa, we're calling for $500 billion new issuance of special drawing rights. But it's not enough to just issue uh, special drawing rights because the special drawing rights when issued, so this new money, let's just call it that, this new money when it's issued is reallocated across countries uh, uh, based on their quotas, which is essentially their size or their weight in the global economy. This will mean that Africa does not get a lot. We ask, we want, we will need about a hundred billion dollars. If five hundred billion dollars of special drawing rights were issued, Africa only gets twenty-one point five. So it's a very, very small amount. So we are also asking for a reallocation of those special drawing rights. As I said before, and as we all see, the big debate in the United States is a new stimulus to the order of almost two trillion dollars. That will take them to about a six trillion dollar stimulus. The the GDP of the whole continent is 1.2 trillion. So they would have added and injected liquidity into the United States economy, six times the economies of Africa. Those are the magnitudes we're talking about. So essentially, yes, we believe that there is a little bit more appetite for SDR issuance, but we're pushing for more. We're not just pushing for SDR issuance, we're pushing for SDR issuance and the reallocation of those uh, SDRs so that uh, Africa 
and the emerging market economies can get a little bit more liquidity to grow out of the crisis. Thank you very much for that. That's very uh, very important to keep in mind. We need a re reallocation too, not just to increase the allocation. Uh, let me take some questions from the audience now, and I would like the audience to ask uh, to send more questions to the q and function. I would like to see a little bit more uh, questions. The first question there is about, and you, you talked a little bit about this in your presentation, fiscal and monetary policy. How should it face the development challenges uh, because of COVID-19? Could you elaborate a little bit more on how you see monetary and fiscal policy working together to handle the, the macroeconomic crisis? So in the developed countries, they have used both of these tools to respond to the crisis, mostly the monetary tools, but they've also used some fiscal tools. There was a lot of forbearance, for example, in terms of tax payments, uh, 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 businesses were asked to defer tax payments for three months, then another three months. There was actually a stimulus that was given uh, on the other side to businesses. There was a huge injection from the public sector of social safety nets. We saw uh, an increase in sort of social security benefits, food banks and, and things like that that were put in place. This means that government lost revenue, but continues to expand on the expenditure, expenditure side to support uh, its economies. On the monetary side, of course, you use your central banks and your central banks. So at the global level, we talk about SDRs, but at the national level, we talk about fiscal stimulus. We saw that the European Union, for example, injected somewhere in the order of $759 billion into its economies. This is the Central Bank of Europe essentially just printing money, issuing new papers so that countries can have access to more liquidity. So when you do that, then you can ensure that businesses continue to have working capital, that businesses can still have their export credits, they can uh, uh, import more importantly because countries need foreign currency to be able to import goods. So that's the monetary tool. And also you can use that monetary tool to manage your inflation rate so the prices don't go up very hard. Now on the continent, because we don't have what is called a hard currency in many of our countries, maybe except South Africa, our currencies are not robust enough. We've seen actually some of our currencies, even including South Africa, lose 20% of their value during this crisis. So it's very difficult for us to have the kinds of monetary uh, policy tools that we need, which is why we cannot ourselves provide endless stimulus uh, uh, to the economy. We need some uh, injections of foreign capital or foreign hard foreign currency reserves to be able to provide that injection. The second thing, of course, is that because we still import a lot of our basic necessities, food, even when the material we need for investment, we need FX, we need foreign currency to do that. So we need to be able to then purchase dollars or euros or something. Uh, and so again, we don't have a central bank or a, an African central bank, which is a big project of the African Union to be able to, well, it's one thing to have the central bank, it's another thing to create that robust currency that becomes a reserve currency that you can do. In Asia, as you know, when we had the last financial crisis in the not 2008, but 1997, the Asian financial crisis, the Asians got together and created the Chiang Mai Initiative. At the time, they wanted to create something similar to the IMF with a strong uh, a currency reserve, but they ended up with the Chiang Mai Initiative, which essentially just said, you know, if we created a sort of buffer, a basket, amongst ourselves where we lend to each other in times of crisis. But because Africa is so, we, we, our, the correlation of our economies is so high, it's very difficult for any one of us to lend to the other in terms of crisis, but this is a global crisis and everybody is in trouble. So we do need global international institutions to provide that additional liquidity. And, and that's where I think one of the things that is missing, as I talked about the response recovery and reset and in the reset part of my, 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 my presentation, I talked about revising and revisiting the international financial architecture. We do need to look as Africa about how we want to re-engage the international financial architecture post this crisis. Do we need an African central bank? Do we need our economies to become more robust so that you know, we can have currencies that are slightly more robust uh, in times of crisis to deal with it? Thank you very much for that. In fact, linked to the question of fiscal policy, uh, as you know, one of the most effective ways that we see advanced countries uh, respond to this particular crisis is what are called furloughing schemes, which is that they're providing ways that firms keep their workers on the payroll because what we really have is a kind of aggregate supply shock. The pandemic is aggregate supply shock because people, firms cannot simply get back the workers back into in the workforces. 
but it's a it's more of a challenge to have following schemes or anything that allows firms to keep their workers on when you have large informal economies and you have a lot of self employed so how do you see that challenge the challenge of trying to keep the informal eco economy which is has been very badly hit as you mentioned in your presentation how do you do that when you can't use a mechanism that have been pretty effective in the western countries well i think what you do there is then you do a, a cash transfer programs and unlike in the western economies where we have of course you know large uh, manufacturing companies we still have small and medium enterprises and what you try to then do is see whether you can help business the banking sector provide additional loans to those small and medium enterprises so they stay open because a lot of them again are essentially businesses that are doing providing local services that can continue uh, even within the crisis you know they can transform of course their businesses immediately to online orders we've seen and we've done some studies in Kenya Nigeria uh, and i think morocco where we saw that businesses that were linked to the internet and could actually continue their businesses through the internet survive the crisis much better and those ones we should ensure that they get the additional capital that is needed so what government could do is essentially do what the united states has done and others but we don't have the liquidity is inject provide some more capital to the banking system see whether they can reduce interest rates so that the private sector can get one that is on sort of the continuing business side the other thing that we can do of course is that we're in dire need of new investments in the infrastructure sector so one there is it is not inconsistent to actually launch huge infrastructure projects this is what uh, china did to come out of the 2008 crisis where you hire people and so rather than you do sort of food for work schemes so you build infrastructure but you provide additional uh, resources and finally of course there is a whole category then that becomes vulnerable that is just going to need some resources to make it through the crisis and then they will need some kinds of social safety net injections but then because they are informal it's difficult to find them and this is where i think technology becomes important can we find ways of getting these people into systems that will provide additional we can know i take an example i think when we talk about it it's quite theoretical i take an example of egypt egypt has 3% of its population which is uh, uh, below the poverty line. But 40% of its population is vulnerable. These are the ones in the informal sector. And that 40% falls. How do we catch them? How do we find them? Do we know where they are so that we can do the cash transfers so that they can survive at least the crisis and then get new injections of capital to continue their business? So I think these are the kinds of things we now need to do is begin to build databases of those that need help and then differentiate the help. And do you see that? I mean, do you see a level uh, uh, leveling up of technology in terms of using them to using you know to reach cash for which is the pool of cash transfers, mobile mobile phone banking, so on? Do you see evidence of that? Because clearly, technology has become very crucial. Uh, remote working, for example. I mean, do you see that? Listen, in Kenya, in Kenya, I think that the uh, the central bank will have a problem soon because there is no more use of almost no use of cash. Every day, the number of transactions that are done through mobile systems and internet systems is almost two hundred million dollars. It's all done virtually, and so I think that if there is one example of a society that has almost moved to a cashless internet-based society, it is Kenya. And I think that's really the the sort of vision of the future is how can we do more of that uh, in many more of our economies. So yes, we are seeing an increased use of technology to respond to different challenges. Healthcare, increasingly in Rwanda, in Ghana, you know, there's a lot of consultations that are happening online. So, so yes, we are seeing that, but of course, and this is where the inequality happens, right? It's, it's, it's possible where it's affordable and where there is access to energy and you have the basic enablers of the infrastructure. Where you don't, then, you know, if you're in Mali or Burkina Faso or places like that, then we see that gap widening. We also see the gap widening within societies. Women have less access to the internet and can afford it uh, because it's too expensive. So then there is a widening gap between men and women again uh, in terms of income levels. So I think we do need to look at closing all of these gaps. Otherwise, as we celebrate the sort of migration to, 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 to the internet and to technology, we will also have to begin to look at mourning you know, huge inequalities in our societies via countries and also gender discrimination. Absolutely, no, th thank you for that. It's a very important point. 
I have two questions now against the audience. One question is going back again to the question of, back of, of the pandemic and its effects. Uh, the question is that some countries have taken a, a denialist approach, have denied the, their, the pandemic's effects, uh, not trusting the science and dismissing the effectiveness of the vaccine. What implications do you see of this on African cooperation, the pandemic and economic recovery in the future? Um, there has been some uneven uh, response to the use of science in the, on, the, on the pandemic. Would you see that as uh, something that can be uh, worked on and can have more cooperation on these issues? I think that the Africa CDC has done a fantastic job in, in sort of bringing the continent together, the health ministers, the, our scientific researchers together to sort of have a common position on, on, on how to respond to the crisis. So my sense is that one of the things that the crisis has done is really bring some of these communities of practice together. And, and so what we will end up seeing probably at the end of this crisis is much stronger collaboration around issues of you know, science issues of, uh, of research. You know, there is a huge move now to see can Africa begin to research around vaccines and produce vaccines on the continent. So, so my sense is, uh, um, and then of course there needs to be more communication around, you know, what some of the science is saying and why it's saying what it's saying so that people begin to believe it more. So it, it will take some time maybe in some geographies for that to happen. But, you know, we were actually just talking and ECA would launch a survey together, hopefully with Africa CDC to get a sense of sort of how much vaxxers, anti-vaxxers do we have on the continent? We don't believe that number to be quite high. Thank you very much for that. Then there's a question that I was also I was going to ask, but the question comes to the audience, that in that, as you mentioned, the, the need to provide liquidity to the system. And already, as we know, uh, the discussion going on in the US is that concern about inflation. The Biden stimulus package is quite, is a, have a significant positive return on liquid demand. Do you see that say, especially as you mentioned also, the, given the, the depreciation of the currencies and food being imported, that creates additional cost pressure on inflation. So is there a danger that with the stimulus, we might see an in, in, increase in inflation post-pandemic? There might be a small spike, but I think the danger is that you see uh, 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 an increase in inflation, um, but, a, 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 but combined with, an, with a scarcity in food, as opposed to at least some provision of some of the necessary you know, working capital for us to be able to continue to produce more local food that will bring down the prices. Because this is the, this is the challenge, right? If we can import, so, so what, why we need the, the, the SDRs, why we need some of that liquidity, is that we need to import the irrigation rigs. We need to import the fertilizer so that we can produce the food domestically and bring down those prices. So, so in some sense, Africa still has this balancing act to play, right? Which is essentially that a lot of our food commodities are still imported. So there is some substantial component of, of even locally produced food, which is uh, uh, induced from foreign uh, 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 spending. But until we do that, we cannot really then begin to to talk about a recovery into the economy. But then if we get, again, that additional liquidity, we can get jobs back on. And with jobs back on, with more revenue on the demand side, you can also begin to flatten the in inflation curve. So we can attack it from both sides, but we need that liquidity to be able to help us do that and do it in a way that works sustainably. For that. Uh, also, now I want to go shift a little bit towards the longer term and, and what we might tend to see over the next few years. Now, one of the things that we found, and this is work that we've just finished, uh, paper that we've just finished in UNI Wider, using new data on economic transformation for a lot of low-income countries in Africa and elsewhere uh, for the most recent period, not, not the COVID period, but just before that, we find a manufacturing renaissance. We find that while there was the industrialization, as you know, the discussion on deindustrialization, Till about the 2000s, from the 2010s onwards, we see a manufacturing and so employment in manufacturing has been increasing in many African countries. Um, of course, it seems, and this is also work by other economists like Danny Roderick and Maggie McMillan, that it seems to be more in the, in the smaller firms. The employment increase has been mostly in smaller enterprises, not so much the larger, perhaps more broad enterprises. The question that I would have is that. If that's the case, which seems to be fairly robust, this finding of a manufacturing renaissance, what does the pandemic, what are the pandemic on, on this 
would it, it'll be quite unfortunate if this manufacturing resurgence is stalled because of the pandemic. But of course, it's not obvious how the pandemic might affect manufacturing per se. Um, how many commodities, of course, because of declining prices and so on, you can see that. How do you see the future of manufacturing in Africa, especially if we now seem to see some kind of a renaissance and kind of a resurgence after a period of denationalization? My sense is that we would see a, a, a growth in the manufacturing sector. One, for the simple reason that what the crisis has laid to bay is the, the sort of enormous dependence of the continent on, on, on imported commodities. When the crisis hit, for example, we realized that Africa was importing almost 75% of its drugs from outside the continent. That was about $14.6 billion or an equivalent of about 6 million jobs. I think that as you know, we begin to think about the recovery, um, more countries are thinking of setting up pharmaceutical uh, uh, centers in their country. So the huge imports of drugs and, and health commodities from Europe and Asia is certainly going to reduce because there is going to be, I think, a push. I think we've seen an additional push in the manufacturing textile, maybe more related sector around PPEs, but increasingly also, a push around sort of other health related commodities. And that then can allow countries to begin to think of what, you know, diversification strategies they want to put in place. But we have also seen, and I want us to, 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 to make sure that, you know, we don't put one above the other, huge progress on the sort of technology economies. Countries are di diversifying into the technology sector, which is also quite important for the services uh, uh, sector that we need. So my sense is that as we come out of this crisis, with a combination of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that allows the continent maybe to pull together its supply chains. Because one of the things that we've been missing, if you want to produce battery storage, for example, on the continent, which we can do and which we should be doing, you will need South Africa's platinum, Burundi's uh, nickel and DRC's cobalt. It was very difficult to do that before because they were both in very different economic zones. And so, uh, uh, tariffs and non-tariff barriers were quite extensive. With the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, we hope that those barriers are broken. And so you will begin to see new industry come up. I think you're on mute. Uh, I have quite a few questions in but I know you're constrained by time. So let me yes, just please. one question that I think is uh, interesting, which is linked to what you said just now, which is that uh, we talk about technology, we need, but we need good regulation. We also need competition. So what about regulatory frameworks, perhaps linked to the free trade area discussion that can make sure that first technology is harnessed because un technology is not regulated as we know can, can do harm. And secondly, also in terms of competition, we need a strong competition policies, which is perhaps not been the case so far in many African countries. So regulation and competition, how do you think can make some progress there? So the Economic Commission for Africa and the African Union last year put together the digital strategy for Africa. And I think what that did was begin to lay the groundwork, what Africans, our heads of states, and, and, and saw as you know, a vision for how Africa develops an e, e, e economy, particularly linked to e-commerce. In the international community, as you know, huge debates at the WTO, you know, how you regulate e-commerce, what we need to do. So the push that Africa is doing is to say, we need to harmonize, but we also need to ensure that that regulation is regulation that is consistent with the ambitions of the continent. And I think a lot of work is going into that to ensure that when we get to those global spaces, we actually do have an African position that is a position that says Africa needs to also grow towards prosperity and we need regulation that will work. Now, this is at the international level. At the continental and country level, we also do need regulation, of course, on privacy, on management of data, on data storage. And I think a lot of countries are beginning to put those regulations in place. Again, Kenya is a case in point, but Tunisia stands out as a country that's putting in good regulation, Togo. So we are looking across the continent to see where we have good regulation. The biggest issue is, of course, data privacy, use of data. But there is also regulation around pricing, around access, around the last mile. And all those things need to come together for us to actually be able to build a sustainable uh, e-economy. Secondly, on the question of competition policy, 
Of course, of course, of course. The second round of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is going to be dealing with issues of industrial policy, competition policy, uh, intellectual property rights. We are trying now to bring in the whole question of e-commerce and e-regulation. Competition policy uh, so far has not been sort of given the right place on the continent. Uh, uh, we, we've had a couple of sort of large uh, quote unquote monopolists in our economies, but mostly we've had the small and medium enterprises. But I think as our economies continue to grow, we are beginning to see uh, the need for a more and better comp uh, competition policy because there are now new entrants into our economies away. If you look, for example, at the ICT sector, mergers and acquisitions last year were almost $2 billion of the whole sector. So we're beginning to get big giants and we need to understand how you regulate and how you manage those. In the financial sector, the same is happening as well. So I think that if, if we thought we did not need competition policy before, now more than ever we do, because we need to begin to understand, you know, in the financial sector with some of the banks, that is sort of, sort of the bigger banks and the mega banks in, in some of our economies, we need to begin to provide a space for a level playing field across the continent. And that is becoming even more important, which is why we believe that competition policy will be important. I suppose the question then would be that we need smart competition policy. I mean, for example, you mentioned the example of Kenya and Ampesa is a great example here, Safaricom. So you want competition policy that actually in, that incentivizes techno innovation. So you don't want to stop that innovative firms, whether they're in finance or whether they're in manufacturing or services. At the same time, of course, you want to stop predatory policies and you don't want to, you want to make sure there is a level playing field. So that's, I think, the, the going to be the big challenge, isn't it? Because smart competition policy is very difficult. And it's also, we see that even in the, in, in the Western countries, to find the, the balance between allowing for innovation, especially for technology firms, at the same time, stopping predatory policies. So in your view, I mean, to what extent do you think uh, one has, we have seen the movement towards those kind of smart competition policies? And is there a question of training competition, people working in competition authority and so on, because this is also needs relevant knowledge of how to do it? Yes, I think, you know, when you look at uh, the competition policy uh, laws in, 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 in Europe, I think one of the best uh, and strongest uh, competition policy institutions is the European, uh, 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 the, Treaty, the Treaty of Rome, I think it is. Uh, uh, I, I think that you know we, we can learn from that. We can we can, and it has actually stood the test of time, including for the ICT sector. Actually, one of the interesting things, as you and I know, is that the Europeans were the first to prosecute the big IT firms because they had a, a, a competition policy structure that was a lot more robust uh, than the United States uh, uh, policies. But I still believe that. Um, Again, part of the, the process and competition policy is really, you know, being able to, as you say, being smart, which means taking into account the new dimensions of competition and of technology as we go forward. And we're learning and we are understanding, for example, Bitcoin. How do you regulate Bitcoin? Where do you start with the regulatory process of Bitcoin if you want to do a level playing field for something as ephemeral as that? So I think there is still a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of learning, not just uh, uh, in, on the continent, but also uh, working together, of course, with the international community, the, the Europeans, I go back to say, I think still have one of the most robust competition policy structures and laws, uh, uh, which we could learn a lot from. But the United States as well, uh, uh, if we look at their competition policy laws, we see that you know the Sherman Act uh, 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 things that we can learn from, particularly as we begin to go into the CFTA and we're looking at, you know, inter, inter country trading, you know, what kinds of regulations do we want to put in place to make sure that this works and works effectively. So there is enough material, I think, uh, from the past that can help us to design something that is, uh, I would say, sufficiently robust economically but then also responds to global and unique challenges that the, con the continent faces. But at the end of the day, competition policy is about uh, uh, unfair uh, price practices or unfair non-price practices that induce different demand choices. And I think that you know, that is where we want to end up. I think we have to be really careful about 
you know, using competition policy for other uh, uh, ends. It's really about ensuring that there is entry. Uh, and, and I think that as Africa grows and as Africa prospers, what we are going to see is some destruction uh, because to, to sort of have that creative innovation and to have more entry, there is going to be destruction. The danger, I think, for the continent is that we try to protect, and we've seen that in many places, we try to protect all dying uh, uh, sectors or even companies at the detriment of the sector. So, you know, if you have a government uh, oil, uh, palm oil making uh, business and you don't close it down, you can never get renewable olive oil or canola oil or whatever oil uh, production happening in those economies. And so for, for Africa right now, the scare actually is that competition policy has to, has to address government uh, <laughs> state-owned enterprises and whether governments will have the, the, the courage to, to, to sort of put in place policies that allow for their destruction uh, uh, in, in, in pure sort of you know, industrial policy uh, ways. I, and, and that, I think, is going to be our biggest challenge. The second biggest challenge is going to be on the way of competition policy. Can we regulate a Google when Google comes onto the continent? Do we have enough? Is our policy robust enough? Are our institutions strong enough to ensure that when Google comes, it doesn't begin to practice unfair trade, uh, uh, go, you know, indulging on fair trade practices? that we cannot regulate because we're just so happy that Google has come to our economies and it's creating some jobs. So there will be tensions and there will be, again, like you said, we will have to be smart about how we do it uh, going forward, but it is clearly something we need to look at. Thank you, Dr. Song, it's very helpful. I think the point that you, as you made is that, you know, you, you have to allow for certain firms to die or to, uh, to, to exit. That's the whole point of, especially with the shift that we're seeing in technology post pandemic, that's going to happen, and I think that that's where governments have to take the take the lead uh, take the lead in in accepting that that would have to happen, including the firms that they themselves might be also uh, owning or part owning. That's really important. I'm going to now draw the session to a close. I know that you have to leave uh, at this point. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Swami, and I think uh, it was really interesting to to for for the not only the presentation but the Q and A to dis discuss so many different issues we talked about, and I think the. Just to end, I would say that what's really important, and this is where UNECA and UNE wider and over the UN United Nations University as such, you mentioned my colleague Dr. Fatima Denton at UNU Indra, is that we need to have a stronger evidence base going forward to think about possible solutions. That's what's really, really important. And uh, certainly in UNE wider, that's what we are doing, trying to create a stronger evidence base, both on what we know about the pandemic's effects, because we're having a better picture, but also the future. And I think that's the, that's where I think the UN agencies, wherever, whichever they might be across the, across in Africa and elsewhere, need to get together and think of how to create a strong evidence base. That's going to be absolutely crucial, I would say. I would say. Would you agree? No, you're very right. And I really want to thank you, Kunal, for, for, for this session. I think one of the areas where we need more evidence-based work and where we are working together, and I hope we can continue to work together with Ms. Denton and her team, is on the climate change. We haven't spoken a lot about it. But again, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, we have a health pandemic, we have an economic crisis, and we have a climate challenge. And we do need to also think about how we resolve that because actually there are backward linkages, right? As well, Africa today and some of our economies are losing 9, 10% of their GDP because of climate, uh, uh, on climate impacts. So we do need to work on that. And I really cherish, I think, the collaboration that we have with uh, UniWider on this particular issue. And of course, then we could do a lot more together, but UN agencies in general collectively could do more. And we are doing more in many cases already together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Songwe. It's been a pleasure having you and look forward to more uh, collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.